Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Now, what we see in chapter 52, 1 through 12, is the salvation of repentant Zion. It begins with the continued promise that the Lord would redeem his people. The focus here is once again on Zion, which is mentioned seven times in this section as Zion or Jerusalem. And the call is made to Zion, the people of Zion, to repent from their sin and how the Lord brings about salvation for them. Now, verse 5 might be a bit confusing on its uh, on the surface. We know that the attacks by Assyria and Babylon on Israel and Judah were tools of God's judgment on his people. In fact, that's been stated through Isaiah as we've been reading along. But from the perspective of Assyria and Babylon, they were unprovoked attacks. Israel and Judah did not pick that fight with those empires. And that's why the Lord states here in this verse that his people have been taken away without cause. Verse 7, by the way, is quoted in Romans 10, so if that sounded familiar to you, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. That gospel proclamation, the good news quoted in Romans 10. In verses 7 through 12, we see this build up of the Lord's promise that he would indeed save his people, not just physically, but spiritually. And it sets the stage to answer the question, how? How is he going to do this? And we begin with the answer in chapter 52, verse 13. Now we need to understand something. Chapter 52, verse 13 through 53, 12. Kind of easy to remember, but it's also easy to get confused. 52, 13 through 53, 12. That's actually one big section, five stanzas of three verses each, all about the suffering servant. This is the servant that Isaiah has been prophesying about. He's now spoken about in great detail, particularly how his life would be when he walked this earth. So we see in the first stanza, chapter 52, verses 13 through 15, the exaltation of the servant. The servant is promised to prosper and be greatly exalted. He would be the preeminent one, but he's also going to be looked down on by people for a time. So there's going to be some humility and exaltation. And indeed we see in chapter 53, 1 through 3, the second stanza, humiliation of the servant. The servant is promised to be humble and despised by men and women. His physical appearance would be nothing special. The servant wouldn't be like King Saul, who's described as tall and handsome. And this servant would also be mistreated by those he came to save. The third stanza, chapter 53, 4 through 6, the affliction of the servant. The servant is promised to not only be despised by men, but to be afflicted by none other than God the Father. This affliction would be necessary in order for the servant to fully bear the punishment that people like you and I fully deserve for our transgression, our iniquity, our sin. He would bear it all. Chapter 53, 7 through 9, the perfection of the servant. As the prophecy of this servant continues, we see the promise that he would indeed be oppressed and yet remain totally humble, quiet even, as he went to his death, even as he would be unfairly judged by man and put to death. And notice his innocence in verse 9 described. That's why I titled this part, Perfection of the Servant. And the fact that the servant would be killed as though he were wicked and yet buried among the wealthy. And the final stanza, chapter 53, 10 through 12, justification by the servant. The servant is promised to be the justifier of the many, the one who would, through whom would be declared righteous all those that we find in the New Testament trust in this servant. He's born their iniquities, rises again from the grave, as verse 12 implies. I mean, a person can't receive a portion with the great and divide captured treasure with the strong if they're still dead, so he will rise from the grave. And it just, by this point, could not be any clearer, could it? The promised servant from Isaiah was none other than Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, Peter quotes from this passage, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25, for you have been called for this purpose. He's talking to Christians. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls." The question is, are you still straying from Christ? 
If so, won't you recognize that God has a coming judgment for your sin? Won't you turn to Jesus as the one who bore that judgment for you? If only you will trust in him as the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Won't you trust in him this very day? And if you do trust in Christ, if you're a follower of him, let us look at this passage and really meditate on it. Isaiah 52 and 53, and praise and follow after Christ, living for him because he suffered and died for us. This has been Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, and I hope you have a great day.